this uh, semester. It was great to be here uh, for it. And uh, so in a way, so I'm, I'm going to speak again about contextuality, uh, sort of in, in following in line from um, uh, Kohei's talk. And sort of this resource theory part is to try to connect to the topic of the workshop and the towards is sort of to let me get away with uh, not quite uh, uh, going all the way and presenting resource theory predictability. But, uh, okay, so I guess I'll do like this. So, uh, so I'll go quickly to the introduction because Kohei has already <laughs> um, introduced the idea, the main idea of contextuality and of this uh, formalism. And uh, so why are we interested in contextuality? Is because it's a fundamental non-classical phenomenon of, of quantum mechanics. And when I, when I use the word phenomenon, I really mean it. So it's not a property of the theory, but it's actually that you can deduce from observable, um, from things you can observe um, in, in nature, and that quantum mechanics does predict. Um, OK, so in recent years, there's been uh, a couple of papers came out sort of suggesting that contextuality could be thought of as a resource for certain quantum computation tasks. So uh, these are two papers that Kohei also mentioned, so I won't go much into it. And um, the um, again, my, my my talk is sort of uh, part of this. Um, so I, I use the, this framework for contextuality uh, introduced by Samson and by Adam Bradenberger, uh, which gives a, uh, a unified and general framework to talk about contextuality and, and non-locality in, in general measurement scenarios. And I'm going to uh, talk about some compositional aspects, how to compose measurement scenarios and, and, and uh, empirical models. And in particular, think about free operations, so operations that shouldn't increase contextuality. And also, uh, moreover, in this framework, there's this qualitative notion of, uh, uh, so this qualitative hierarchy of notions of contextuality, like logical contextuality, strong contextuality, as Kohei presented. And uh, part of what we're doing um, uh, in this work um, is sort of giving a quantitative grading for this thing and sort of introducing something that could be thought about as a measure of how much contextuality a certain empirical model um, displays. So we'll introduce the contextual fraction. And it's, it's a measure of contextuality that satisfies a number of desirable properties. So first, it's general, so it's applicable to any measurement scenario. Um, it'll always have a value between 0 and 1. And 0 will correspond to non-contextual not, so no contextuality is present, and one will correspond to this strong contextuality, which is sort of the strongest notion of contextuality uh, that Kohei presented. Um, so we can compute it with linear programming, um, so it's quite easy to compute, and, and it has a precise relationship with violations of Bell inequalities. And moreover, it's monotone with respect to a number of operations that I'll, I'll discuss. And it also relates to quantifiable, quantifiable advantages in certain quantum computation or quantum information processing tasks. Um, OK, so quickly uh, go into this, um, to, the idea of, to the idea of contextuality. And so um, we sort of, the framework we, we have is uh, we consider um, scenarios where you can perform certain measurements and observe the outcomes, so probabilistic outcomes of these things. So this is the simplest scenario you can think about. You have Alice and Bob. Um, Alice can perform one of two measurements. I'll call them A1 and A2. Bob can perform one of two measurements, B1 and B2. And each of these measurements is, is a dichotomic measurement, so it has outcomes 0, 1. And once, um, if, you, if you perform um, all the possibilities of, of running this experiment, you end up with a table like that, right? where each, each row corresponds to one context, so to one um, compatible choice of measurements, so one, one choice of measurement for Alice and one for Bob. And each column corresponds to uh, the possible uh, joint outcomes. And then so each row should be a probable distribution on these joint outcomes. So in general, I'll just go to this. I don't need to stand there all the time. Uh, so in general, you have a, a measurement scenario. We'll have, we have a set of measurements and a set of uh, possible outcomes, O. Oh, and then we have uh, a cover of x. So this m is a cover of x is just a, a set of sets of measurements, which are, the, which are what we call contexts, and are the measurements that can be performed together, and that therefore should have uh, <coughs> joint values. And you can observe these joint values. And um, so this is the previous example, where you have these four measurements, and the contexts are the ones where you choose one for Alice and one for Bob. And then 
you have uh, possible events, which is so th this event corresponds to Alice choosing to measure A1, Bob choosing to measure B1, and they observing 0, 1, respectively. Um, OK, so this is another example. I'll just go quickly through it. So an empirical model um, will, be, will then be just a family of probability distributions, uh, one for each context, so one for each set of compatible measurements. And uh, these, so we require these distributions satisfy the following compatibility <coughs> condition, which is sort of the, the, the local consistency part of this, uh, which is that they agree on overlap. So whenever two <coughs> contexts overlap, the probability distribution should marginalize the same thing. And this is what is usually called no signaling when we're talking about uh, multipartite scenarios. Uh, okay, so then contextuality, so the question uh, one asks then is we have a bunch of probability distributions that agree on overlaps. Is there a joint probability distribution on, on all the measurements, so on all, on, on the joint outcomes for all the measurements in the system that once marginalized to each context gives back the, the probability distribution we're talking about. And so, so can we glue this local information into a consistent, <coughs> into a consistent global uh, distribution? And uh, so when we can't do that, we say that we have contextuality. Um, OK. OK, and in particular, the case of strong contextuality, which like Kohei already mentioned, is when there is, at the possibilistic level, there's not even one assignment. Uh, there's not, no consistent assignments of outcomes to all the measurements. So you could imagine that you have uh, some assignments of outcomes to all the measurements that are consistent with part of the model. But in, so in this case, it means that there is no, uh, so whatever um, uh, global assignments you consider, uh, there will be one context who, where the restriction of these global assignments uh, is assigned probability zero. So it's not in the support of the probability distribution. Um, so it cannot occur. So, okay, so then, so this motivates um, the introduction of this idea of the contextual fraction. And uh, so, Again, so non-contextuality, we're asking for a global distribution that restricts uh, to all these local distributions. And uh, so the question is, which fraction? So if we can't achieve that, we can ask which fraction of the model does still admit a non-contextual explanation. So we could consider, so instead of asking for a global probability distribution, we just ask for a sub-distribution. So it doesn't have to sum to, so the, the values don't have to sum to one. And we, so we ask for a, a sub-distribution whose marginals to each context will be uh, less than or equal to so, uh, uh, point-wise than the, uh, the distribution we have uh, at each context. And uh, the non-contextual fraction will be the maximum weight of such a uh, sub-distribution, global sub-distribution. So equivalently, we could, we, could, uh, we could think, so what we're doing is taking our empirical model, so our set of uh, local probability distributions, and, and writing it as a convex combination, as a convex composition into a non-contextual model and some other model. And we're asking for what is the maximum weight we can give to this non-contextual part. And it will happen that whenever you do that, the resulting, uh, so, so whenever you maximize this lambda, uh, this other contextual model will actually be strongly contextual. So in fact, we can always write um, any model as a convex decomposition of a non-contextual and a strong contextual model, and the weight that you give to the non-contextual model is what we call the non-contextual fraction, and the one minus lambda is what we call the contextual fraction. Okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll write NCF and CF for these things. Um, so, so just to mention, so I won't, I won't go into details uh, about this, but to mention that this when, so it is easily computable using a, a, uh, by solving this, this particular linear program. Uh, okay, so it's just some plots of um, the contextual fraction for, for different models that come from quantum mechanics and that we, we can produce using Mathematica. And okay, so now how does this relate to violations of Bell inequalities? So Bell inequalities are sort of the inequalities that characterize uh, the polytope of non-contextual models. And <coughs> Um, and so the, so the idea, so, so I, I'll give a very general idea of what this is. Um, so Samson in his lectures at the start of the semester sort of introduced them via 
uh, this um, um, set of formulas that were not uh, that you couldn't jointly satisfy, and therefore that sort of implied a certain inequality. But so I'll forget about how they come about. But the idea is that you have some sort of um, linear inequality. So we have some sort of coefficients that you put to on each of the elements of the table, and so an inequality will be just some linear inequality on that table and this is determined by certain coefficients in a certain bound. And what we care about is, so without loss of generality, we actually take the bound to be zero by changing the coefficient slightly. But we'll call this a Bell inequality when it's satisfied by every non-contextual model. And in particular, it's tight if, if it's saturated by, if there is a non-contextual model that saturates it. And so these are the sort of the linear inequalities that determine uh, what are the non-contextual models. And a model would be non-contextual if it satisfies all such um, Bell inequalities. OK. Um, OK, so a Bell inequality, uh, Bell inequality establishes a bound for the value of this of these left-hand side of the Bell inequality, right, amongst all non-contextual models. But uh, no signaling models in general can violate these. The contextual models will violate uh, Bell inequalities. And uh, in general, so this is the, the expression for what is the maximum value of, of the left-hand side of this inequality for a general no signaling model. And so we need these to sort of normalize the violation of a Bell inequality. So given a model, we, so instead of talking about for, by how much does it violate a certain Bell inequality, we normalize this value by um, the maximal violation that's permitted by a no signaling model. And the idea is to be able to compare across, uh, compare violations across different scenarios where, and, and across different inequalities. So this sort of gives you uh, an idea of the extent to which a certain model violates a certain Bell inequality. And so what's the relation between the contextual fraction and um, violations of Bell inequalities is the following. So if you have an empirical model, then the normalized violation of, of any Bell inequality will be at most the contextual fraction of this empirical model. Moreover, there will be a Bell inequality whose normalized violation will be exactly uh, this, the, the contextual fraction, so will, this, this bound is attained. Uh, there is a Bell inequality for which this bound is attained. And moreover, this inequality will be tight at the non-contextual part of the model and will be maximally violated by the strongly contextual part of the model. And, uh, and when I, I have these inverted commas around the, because there's not necessarily a, a unique decomposition, but for any decomposition, this will be true. OK, and you can find, in particular, you can find this Bell inequality that attains this maximum by just doing the dual linear program of the program we had before. OK, so let's get through this. I don't have much time. Um, OK, so now, uh, so I'll change gear a little bit, and we'll talk about some operations you can, you can do on empirical models. And so the motivation for this is that there might be more than one possible measure, more than one possible way of measuring contextuality. And so one should think about what, what uh, conditions should a good measure of contextuality satisfy. And one thing uh, that it should do, it should, that it should be monotone with respect to operations that don't introduce uh, contextuality. And, uh, and so and these would be sort of the free operations in, in a resource theory of contextuality. And so it's sort of. In, in sort of akin to the resource theories that exist for entanglement, like um, uh, lock um, and for uh, non-locality as well. <coughs> OK. So we'll consider certain operations of empirical models, uh, which, which we think about as not, not really increasing contextuality. And so, so just this is the notation I use. So XMO are sort of is what specifies our measurement scenario. And when I write. E colon XMO means that there's an empirical model of this type, so an empirical model for this measurement scenario. And uh, you, you'll see that the operations that I'll present sort of remind one of the, the operations you see in um, process algebras, with perhaps the exception of one. But, but uh, anyway, so what, what are the operations? So the first of them is uh, relabeling. So you could, you could uh, relabel the um, the measurement. So if you have a bijection between the, uh, so you have, if you have an empirical model on this measurement scenario and you have another measurement scenario, which is sort of where the, the, the measurements are in a bijection, then you could just relabel it and 
transactions that are empirical model in this measurement scenario. So that's uh, quite simple. The other thing is restriction. So if you have a smaller measurement scenario, so you consider a smaller set of measurements um, and a smaller set of contexts in the sense that, so, the, so, so this doesn't need to be necessarily the restriction of this context to those, but it, so anything that's compatible in the smaller model should also be compatible in the larger model, so you should just marginalize the bigger one. Um, similarly, you can coarse grain the outputs, so you could apply some function to the outputs, and uh, which corresponds to some coarse graining. And then, so the, mo the more interesting ones will be these three, which sort of combine two different empirical models. So given two empirical models on the same scenario, you could consider uh, mixing them, so which is just defined by a convex combination of the two uh, at each context. Uh, then you have this choice thing. So the idea here is you have two empirical models on two different measurement scenarios. And the idea is that you, you'll just put them side by side. So you'll consider, um, so the, 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 the new set of measurements are, is the, the disjoint union of the two sets of measurements. So this should be x prime. Um, but there's no, no extra compatibilities are introduced. Right, so you either you'll either perform uh, the measurements on the first measurement scenario or the measurements of the second measurement scenario, uh, and then so the more interesting one uh, is a tensor, which sort of uh, I, I guess relates to what Belen was talking um, yesterday uh, in in sort of a uh, related but different formalism. But the idea here is that uh, you have two empirical models, one in, 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 in two different measurement scenarios, and you now consider the measurement scenario where we should be, which combine these two measurement scenarios, and you think of it as uh, sort of Alice and Bob. So Alice has access to the first measurement scenario, and Bob has Alice to the second measurement scenario. And you can do, um, so it's, they, they, they sort of act independently. So you can, you can ask, uh, um, so what, what are the compatible, the compatible uh, measurement, the, the compatible, so the, the resulting context, so the compatible uh, sets of measurements will be Alice chooses a compatible set of measurements to perform, and Bob chooses another compatible set of measurements to perform, and any, uh, any such choice is, will be a compatible measurement in the resulting uh, scenario. So that's what is, uh, so if you, if you think of these as simplicial complexes, it's a simplicial joint of two simplicial complexes. Um, Right, so the, the resulting contexts are um, the joint unions of contexts from one scenario and the other one. And then the, uh, the probability distributions are just product probability distributions. So the idea is that the two things are happening independently for Alice and for Bob. And, um, and if, if you think about all of these operations should never, should never introduce any extra contextuality. So I mean, the, the three from the previous slide are just relabelings and, and coarse gradings. Um, these one is sort of the two things are happening don't even interact. For this one here, you have, I mean, you, you can certainly a bigger measurement scenario, but you sort of have a product state. So the idea is that, so if, if you think about in, in, in quantum mechanics, it sort of correspond, if, if these would be states, it sort of corresponds to a product state. So the idea, uh, so you always have these product distributions, so you're not introducing any extra correlations between Alice and Bob. And and the mixing, you're just mixing things, so you shouldn't, um, you can't create any extra uh, contextuality. So, you, okay, so what happens with respect to contextual, how does the contextual fraction behave with respect to these operations? Then, okay, so this is obvious for these ones. Uh, if you just do a relabeling, which is a bijection, then you don't change the contextual fraction. For these other two, you could only, you could only <laughs> decrease the contextual fraction because you're forgetting information in general. Uh, then for mixing, then so the contextual fraction of a convex combination of scenarios will be smaller or equal than the convex combination of the contextual fraction. So this means that the contextual fraction is a, is, a, is a convex function. And then for the choice and these tensor operations, so in terms of, so the choice operation, the resulting contextual uh, fraction is just going to be the maximum of the two contextual fractions. Um, or if you think about the non-contextual fraction, is a minimum of the two. Uh, 
And for the tensor, you have this complicated expression, which is much easier, it's easier to see in terms of the non-contextual fraction, which is going to be the product of the two non-contextual fractions. And so this is an equality. Um, OK. So in particular, for these three things, if you take e prime to be non-contextual, i.e. the contextual fraction being 0, then you see that you're not, so you're not <coughs> augmenting the, context, the amount of contextuality that you add for e. So, so you, if you think of composing a model with a non-contextual model in any of these three ways, this should never introduce more contextuality. And indeed, that's what you find. OK. okay so uh, just to wrap up, so I'm, I'm just going to talk briefly about contextual fraction quantum advantage. So the idea, as I said, is that contextuality has been associated with some quantum advantage in, in, in computational or information processing tasks. And part of the idea of having a measure of contextuality, like the contextual fraction, is that we should be able to quantify uh, contextuality and to relate to, so if, if, if one quantifies these advantages in, in some way, then we should be able to relate the amount of contextuality to the, the amount of advantage you get in, in, in these tasks. So one example um, is this work by Robert Rausendorf that both Kohei and I mentioned. And uh, I think Nadish uh, gave a talk about it uh, maybe three weeks ago or something. Uh, so for those of you who were here, probably heard uh, a lot about this thing. Uh, so what is the idea here? You have a, a measurement-based uh, quantum computation scheme where the classical control can only perform uh, linear operations in, in Z2. So the classical control is the thing that pre-processes the input and post-processes uh, the output and in between sort of determines the flow of, of computation. And so the result here, and, and so the additional power to compute nonlinear functions resides in a resource empirical model. Um, so, uh, and, and the class control just determines which measurements is going to perform and how the, the computation is going to evolve. Okay, and what, so the result by Rosendorf was that if you have uh, such a, an L2 MBQC, so a, a, a measurement based quantum computing scheme of, of this form, that deterministically computes a nonlinear Boolean function. Uh, so, in general, this, this is a probabilistic computation, but if, if it deterministically computes a certain linear function, then it must be strongly contextual. It's a nonlinear function. And moreover, the probabilistic version was that if the nonlinear function is computed with a sufficient large probability of success, then this implies that there is some contextuality there. But you can, we can refine this in terms of the contextual fraction. And this is my last slide, so. Oh, forget about the other one. Um, and what you get is the following. So you, you can, um, so if you write this new f represents the average distance between the function that you're trying to compute and the closest uh, linear function. So it sort of uh, is an indication, is a measure of how difficult the problem is, so how far from a linear function uh, this is. And if I write ps for the probability of success, then we have that 1 minus ps is larger than or equal to the non-contextual fraction times this hardness. So if you think about, if you fix this uh, target function you're trying to compute, and you're trying to increase the probability of success, you see that this left-hand side will decrease, and therefore uh, this has to decrease. The so non-contextual fraction has to decrease, so you have to use a resource with more contextuality. And um, okay. uh, in particular, this gives back the, uh, the case of strong contextuality and, and, and determinism that I had before. So further direction, we should. So there's also a measure of of, of contextuality in terms of negative probabilities. Um, that in particular, Hattie Barrett Safarov has been uh, talking about. And so one question is how this relates, how this contextual fraction relates to it. So I'll just that uh, we know quite a bit of that. Uh, also, what can you say about signaling models and about the resource theory? Uh, so one of the operations that was Missing in there was uh, some notion of sequencing. So we, we have some ideas of how to do this, but uh, it's not quite complete yet. But you'll have to change the notion of empirical models to include uh, some, causal, some causal structure. So uh, also related to what Shane uh, spoke about uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, which was about causal structure empirical models. And also the question is, uh, can we have more results of the kind 
uh, that I just presented about relating quantum advantage and, and uh, the amount of contextuality you have in a certain model. Metric? Probably yeah. not, right? This is a metric. Mm. It's, it's, a distance. Distance. it's not a distance, right? So. I mean, if you think of it, I mean, with that number, is it a... Um, so, is, so is the number is associated to a particular empirical model, so I'm not quite sure. You mean a metric between... Like the norm, there's a metric. Yeah. yeah. It's quite funny. Yeah. Sorry, I missed uh, one thing. You talk about uh, uh, linear programming to uh, give value for But then uh, the algebra that you presented, there were lots of non-linearity in the composition. So, the, so how are these two aspects related? So, um, so, so the linear programming is about how, how, how one calculates this uh, contextual fraction for a given empirical model, or how one calculates uh, the Bell inequality corresponding to it if you do the dual program. And uh, so the idea of this algebra is that, so these are operations you can perform in empirical models. And then uh, what is um, what I present in the end is how, how the contextual fraction behaves with respect to these operations. But, uh, and, and so it sort of behaves nicely with respect to these operations. It's like, you know, it doesn't introduce any, uh, any uh, contextual fraction doesn't increase when you, when you, when you Not quite sure. How, how this, uh, so you do use so in particular in order to show what happens for the tensor, which is the most difficult case. Yeah. You do need to use uh, so the, the proof that the non-contextual fraction is the product of the other two uses the linear programming. Uh, so you use the description in terms of the linear programming to prove one of the sides of the inequality, and, it, and uses a dual program to prove the other side of the inequality. That's what well, it's you said, if you knew how a model was built up, you could decompose the computation into... Yeah. <coughs> Sorry? If, so if, 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 you knew, if you knew how a model is built up in terms of these operations, for example, yeah. then you could, uh, you could decompose the computation of the contextual fraction uh, by, in terms of these components. Right? So if you, have the, if you know the contextual fraction of the components, then you, you know the contextual fraction. <laughs> Okay, so let, let us extend the uh, rule again and continue discussion.